This year, if you look behind me on the screen, you'll see up there it says Fentley Joint. That's 2024. We want our church and our lives to be joined fitly, where every piece is in the right place and putting all the pieces together. And we've been doing that since the beginning of the year. where We've been going through the, the most basic uh, aspects of truth for, for, our, for our ministry here, for our church. What is it that we believe? We started out in the first week of the year with the existence of God. I believe that God exists. And we went through why I believe God exists. I believe that this book is the Word of God. That was the next, the, the next time we looked into, the, into the, uh, the Word of God to find out why I believe that this book is from God. Then we went on and looked at creation, the fact that God did create the whole world. We are not here as a cosmic accident. We were made intentionally by the Creator. Then we began to look at the righteousness of God and then the sinfulness of man. And we went into the judgment that has to be placed upon sin by a holy and righteous God. Then we looked at the perfect, sinless, substitutionary sacrifice that was Jesus when he came to this earth and took upon himself human flesh and lived in the likeness of man. He actually lived the same life that you and I live, but never with any sin. We looked at all these different truths leading us to salvation. The fact that if that after he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead, and he's offering now the gift of eternal life to anyone who will put their faith and trust in him. We looked at the fact that Jesus is coming back. He told us his last promise is that he will return. He then promised us that he would not leave us comfortless, that he was ascending to heaven, but he would send down the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us into all truth. We've looked at all these truths and we've come to the realization then from Scripture that he has instituted the church to be his body to accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish while he is in heaven and the Holy Spirit is here. He, we become the, his functionaries. We do what he wants done. So the same way that if I want to take a drink of that water over there, I command my feet to take me over to it. I command my arm and my hand to grasp it, and I bring it to my lips and take a drink. This is a function of my mind telling my body what to do. Well, the head of the church is Christ, and so he tells us what to do, and we're supposed to do it. So we've looked the last few weeks about the church, how it's structured, and how it's supposed to operate. Now this morning, we're now going to look into John chapter 13. Let me give you this background, and we'll pray. John chapter 13 uh, is, is coming now to the very end of Jesus' ministry before he goes to the cross. He will spend chapter 14, 15, 16 teaching the disciples, and then 17 praying for the disciples before then we come to the very last events of that night. But they are in this moment, they are in an upper room, and they are just Jesus and his disciples, and they are going to have what we now call the Last Supper. And Jesus is going to institute this as the way to remember what he did for us on the cross when we have that juice and we eat that bread together. That was instituted there at that night. So the setting we're entering into is exactly that moment. So you can imagine then this is a very poignant moment where Jesus is looking ahead to the fact that he's about to become sin for us. When he hung on that cross, God the Father placed the entire sin debt of the whole world on his own son. And his son paid the price for everything I've ever done and everything every human being has ever done wrong. Jesus paid for it. That's why he's capable of saving you t today because your sin has already been paid for 2,000 years ago. But on this night here in chapter 13, Jesus is looking forward to that cross. He's only a couple hours away from being in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's going to go to prayer and it's going to be so intense and the anxiety is so strong that he'll begin to sweat great drops of blood. He's just a couple hours away from that. So for the next few minutes, whatever he wants to do with him, it's going to be pretty important. And there's one moment that he does on purpose. That's in chapter 13. We're going to look at it this morning and apply it to our lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray one more time that you please meet with us this morning. I pray that your word would help us. God, I pray that you would work on our hearts. 
Father, you know every life, every situation. You know mine. You know the person who's here for the first time. You know the person who's been here for decades. God, you know what each person needs. Holy Spirit, I pray that you please meet me here. I ask in your precious name. Amen. So here we are. We are in the book of John, chapter number th uh, 13. I'm going to jump in to, chapter, to verse number 4. Get a running start. Here we go. He, that's Jesus, riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every way. You are clean, but, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he saith unto him, Know ye what I have done to you? He called me master and lord. You say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master hath washed your feet. He also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. This morning, I want to talk to you about this idea. You and I have to become like our master and learn how to wash feet. This is Jesus, the same one who, if you just go back one chapter into chapter 12, you will see that as he is now reaching the apex of his ministry, he's actually on the upswing. If he had not surrendered himself to die, if he had allowed his disciples to defend him, or if he had called down those legions of angels that he, had, he, had, he commanded, he could have stopped the crucifixion, and he was at a certain point of popularity with the people that they would have easily made him their king and risen up against the Roman government. But he would not then have died for the sins of the whole world. You see, at this point in his ministry, Jesus ha was the most popular person in Judea. He was famous. He was so famous that the people who had been taught from the time they were little, the time they were infants, that there is a Messiah coming. There is a king who's going to rescue us from this Roman oppression. And we were waiting for him, and he's coming soon. They've been waiting for all their lives for it, and now they keep hearing these, these things about this one Jesus. And every time they hear a new story, it's going up. Just The, 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 the amount of evidence grows every story that this seems to be that Messiah. Well, then they hear that he is coming, and this is just the day before. And it's, uh, this says, and the next day, much people that were coming to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. The book of Matthew, the book of Mark, tell us that not only did they use the palm fronds, they also took off their own coats, and they did this. They laid the, 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 the coats in front of him and the branches in front of him. And the Bible says that Jesus, he came in triumphantly to Jerusalem. Now, there was a prophecy that was written that he, this is what the prophet said, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. 
Now, that's, that, that's not how it's normally done. When a king comes in, he comes in on a white stallion. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that when Jesus comes back again, he will be on a white horse. But this time, when he comes in to, who, to his capital city as king, he comes riding on a, an ass's colt, a baby donkey. He comes in on this, and imagine his feet might be dragging. And as he's coming in, the people are, I mean, just the, the road is lined for miles with throngs of people. And they are excited. And here's what they're saying as he comes, as he comes in. They are saying, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. They, they're, they're, everybody's now realizing this has got to be him. And they're hoping, they're expecting that when he gets in there, something great is going to happen. Maybe they'll open the temple to him. Maybe he will lead an army and, and overthrow the, the pilot, the, the Roman magistrate. Maybe, I don't know, but this is an exciting moment. Now, this is someone who his disciples have already years before come to the conclusion, this is Messiah. They have watched him as he has healed people at a touch or even a word, and sometimes from a great distance. They've watched as he has repaired broken bodies. They've watched as he's put sanity back into crazed minds. They've watched him as he has transformed nature to where storms became instant calms. They've watched him take food, just a small lunch, and divide it up to where it could feed multitudes of thousands. They've watched all this happen. Several of his disciples got to watch as he actually was transfigured before their glory, his, his glory that he would have had throughout eternity shone through him. And that moment they were scared, the Bible says, as on top of a mountain, there came Moses and Elias, and they came and ministered unto Jesus. And Jesus was there with three of his disciples, and those disciples were scared because it was such an intense moment. They had seen all of this, and they were ready now in their understanding this was about to become the king of the world. That is the context of a man who then gets up from supper, lays aside his garment, takes a towel, girds himself. Then Jesus begins to wash the disciples' feet. Took an apron of some sort, girded himself. Now when we put this on, this instantly identifies someone. Servant. A server. That's what this means. We'll never see a CEO to give a stock report wearing something. Never see the president stand before the United Nations. This. What you get when you go to a restaurant or a coffee shop. This is what people butcher. This is what we do because we're going to do dirty work. And the king of kings. The one who these gentlemen are under, they are banking on the fact that they've picked the right one. That this, in their lifetime, by some fluke of God's providence, the, it wasn't in their grandma's lifetime or in their great grandpa's lifetime or in their great 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 uncle's lifetime. It was in their lifetime that the Messiah's come and they have identified him. It's him. And for years now, everything he's done, everything he's said, has just gone to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. This, this is the Messiah. Two of his disciples have already come to him privately. Their mom said, Lord, can I ask you? Two sons, you know what? James and John. You actually establish your kingdom. Get so that one of them is sitting on your right and one's on your left. I don't care which one, just my two sons. <laughs> Jesus, the way he handled it was so great. It's not for me to decide. Then he says, uh, you know what matters to me? Servants. A few minutes later, the other disciples had seen this thing. They're all mad at him because they all wanted to have that same position. 
I've been here longer. I got here last the week before you got here, okay? I said I'd go in first, okay? I've been doing more, whatever it was. Actually, and Jesus calls them together. You see, they had recognized it. To them, he was no longer just a Galilean. He was the Messiah, the King. And now he puts on an apron, kind of suddenly. And then he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel, or if he was dirty. Now, I want you to understand, when he did that, that meant he, you've got these men sitting around, and he was now going to get down in front of them, lower than them, to their feet. Now, you've, I'm sure you've heard this before, but of course, we now have shoes that cover our whole foot. They would have had a, just sort of their goal of, in, a, in a shoe of that time was simply to have something between you and the ground. So the whole goal was to have a piece of leather or something and some sort of strap, what we call now a sandal, that would keep it on your foot. So as you're walking through, uh, you cannot forget that we are now so spoiled with paved roads. And if you ever have a place that you go to, uh, we've, we, we were in Mexico a few, a few uh, months ago and, and uh, got to a place where there's a lot more just dirt roads and Sure enough, your shoes are getting dirty. Now imagine if you were barefoot, you'd be really dirty. Imagine if you just had a sandal on, you'd be pretty dirty. And so it was a common practice that uh, if you ever went to somebody who's important and they had servants, one of, the, one of the functions of that, rather than bringing those dirty feet into the home, would be to, to sit someone down to that at the entrance devil and where they would take off those shoes and wash those feet so you don't drag all that dust into the house. And so that would have been the most lowly of jobs. Now, to illustrate this, this morning, I've got a bucket of water right here, and i got a towel. I want you to understand that this is an incredibly humbling job. I want you to understand that for the person doing it, it's humbling. It's not, it's not the job that you're vying for. Now, as I have water right here, and I have a towel, and I have a seat right here, I am going to guess that the men of this church right now are desperately hoping I don't pick you. You are thinking about the fact, do my socks have holes in them? You're thinking, Pastor, please don't make me roll up my pant leg, untie my shoe, take off my sock. You are not looking forward to feeling my hands around your foot in this water, in front of every, right? Am I right? If I picked you, you would not feel honored. In fact, if, if you were Peter, you would not feel honored. You would feel awkward. Look at verse number six again. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, Dost thou wash my feet? Peter answered and said, and Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Oh, no way. No, they're never going to wash my feet. <laughs> this is not happening. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> I, no, I don't, no, no. You see, this is extremely inappropriate. It just feels awkward. To have the man who you call Lord, the man who is the master, to have him now kneel there before in front of you and take your dirty, dusty, grimy foot and wash it off and dry it off. It just feels so wrong to have someone who's so much higher than me doing that to me. And for Peter... It's hard. Then, once Jesus says, well, if you don't let me do that, you're not one of mine. It's interesting to say. If you do this, or you're, you're not, you're not he's, there's, here's his actual words. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Then Peter makes a logical conclusion. He says, okay, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And then Jesus then teaches an incredibly important lesson this morning. I want to tell you. Jesus said to him, if you come in here and you've already been washed, you don't need those parts washed again. You are clean every whit. 
every little piece, you're fine, except your feet. Now, the, that, the lesson he's teaching is this. When Jesus saves someone, he saves them one time. He washes away all the filth of sin the day that someone becomes a born-again Christian. When someone gets saved, the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away all that sin that would otherwise send you to hell. And you are now saved. So now you do not have to ever again get fully resaved. It doesn't have to happen. Amen? You're done. And so when you come to him and he says, you know, there's something on that foot that needs to come off. Well, wash the whole thing. You don't need the whole thing. You're already clean. You are done. So I got saved the moment I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and my heart was washed white as snow. But I need, on a regular basis, to have the grime and dust of the world that gets on me as I go through a traverse, this, this trail through this world. I get dust and dirt and grime on my toes, and so I need to go to the master again, and I need to have him again wash my feet again. I don't need to have my whole body washed. I'm already clean, but I got some stuff on me. That's why the book of, of 1 John, written to Christians, it's, there's a great verse in there. And it tells us that if I, uh, let me get, it, get it for you. It tells you that as a Christian, my job is to, is to get my sins forgiven, not because I have never been saved, but because of this. If we confess our sins, talking about we as in John and the other Christians writing to you, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's what that means then. I got saved when I believed in Jesus Christ. I'm now his. I'm his forever. And when I step into eternity, I get to step into eternity of bliss in heaven with God. Not because of my own good works, not because of anything I've ever done. Is this on, guys? Is it? Are we, are you, okay. But simply because of Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. But I mess up. I sin. I need to go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I told a lie I can't. And if I don't, I just let my feet build up all that grime and nastiness. And when I try to come, get close to God, he says, got to get those feet cleaned off. You know who does that cleansing? Jesus himself comes down and cleanses it. So Peter submits to it. And let me say this, this morning, if you have ever believed that you get to go to heaven because you have kept yourself clean enough, let me tell you, you're going to be sadly disappointed when you get to heaven and God says, that is filthy. That is dirty because you and I can never keep ourselves clean enough. The only way to heaven is to have Jesus wash away your sin. And if this morning, if you've already been saved, you are good to go. That doesn't mean you don't need to have your feet washed on a regular basis. They need to go to God and say, God, today I was really short with my kids. Lord, you know I got mad and I cussed three times. Said, I'm sorry, Lord. Lord, you know I went back to the bottle again. Lord, please forgive me, God. Please help me to get back up. We need to constantly going back and getting our feet washed again and again and again and again. But that heart stays clean from this point on until the end of eternity if you're saved. And if you're, if you're trusting in a religion, you're not, you're not saved yet. If you're trusting in your good works, you're not saved yet. If you're trusting the fact your mom was such a good lady, you're not saved yet. But when you come to Jesus Christ and him alone, he saves you from all that sin. Then you can come back and get cleaned again. Okay, so then Peter submits to it and gets his feet washed. Jesus finishes the last disciple. And now, as he finishes, he then teaches them the lesson that he was trying to give them. And here's the lesson. Verse number 12, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, he also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. He just, coming to the very end of his ministry, he's now 
very close to ascending to heaven where he's going to be for the next two millennia. And he is going to then let those disciples go on a commission to the whole world to spread the gospel. And individual after individual are going to be brought to Jesus Christ and they're going to have their lives changed. And Jesus wants to institute one last super important commission. said, this is what I'm going to give you. I'm about to die. Let me give you this last thing. Before I go, this is a very important. Let me wash your feet, the very lowest of the low jobs, as the man who is the master, who is the Lord, who is the, the, the great one, the king of all kings, I'm going to wash your feet, gentlemen. And then I want you to go out and wash others' feet. The Bible tells us that God sent his only begotten son into the world to become sin for us. But before he did, he knelt down in front of mere mortals' feet and he put them into water and he rubbed off the grime and he put, patted it down with a towel and he got up and went to the next person, next person, next person. And the last words he said before he went to the cross, he said, listen, I want you to do what I've just done. I want you to emulate what I've done for you. Today we have a call from God to emulate the master. We need Christians here who are left behind by Jesus Christ. We have a mission to accomplish on this earth. And that mission is to do what Jesus has told us to do. And here we find an extremely important aspect of that mission, and that is that you and I are supposed to be washing other people's feet. We're supposed to be serving them in the lowest capacities. This morning I want to encourage you to become a foot washer. You say, Pastor, you don't know. I have college, college uh, uh, diploma. Become a foot washer. You say, Pastor, uh, you don't know. I'm, I'm older now. I've got grandkids. Be a foot washer. Well, you don't know. I'm just a junior higher. Be a foot washer. That means you are willing to do the lowest of the low job anywhere around here. Anywhere in your life, it's you who, who, who does it. That's supposed to be your job, Mr. Footwasher. Why? Because we have a master who said, I'm the master, and you're right. I am the Lord. You're right. Now, just like I do, you do, because you're not greater than me. And if my responsibility is to do those low jobs, I guarantee you it's your responsibility to do the lowest jobs. If you're going to be a real Christian, your job is to become a foot washer. Our church right here, here we are, little, this little, 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 little building here, you know what this building, your church is going to be great at if it's going to be great at anything? Serving other people. Just becoming simple servants. That's what it is to be a Christian. So this morning I want to give you some aspects of being a foot washer. Number one, it's awkward to be a foot, to be a foot washer sometimes. Let me say that it's kind of awkward when you are an adult who has never taught kids before and you open your Bible and try to get these little boys under control and teach them the Bible. It's not always easy. It's kind of awkward when you're an adult and you get in front of little kids and you sing, I'm in right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. You're like, sir, I'm, I'm in my 40s. Have you ever done Father Abraham? Father Abraham. It, it, it's a little awkward. But that's what a servant does. Let me say it's awkward when somebody says, the toilet's overflowing. to walk in there and take care of what's ever in that tank. Make it happen. That's not my job. That is. You're going to be a foot washer. It's the foot washer who decides, I am not above taking care of some older person who can no longer take care of themselves to change diapers, to clean up bodily fluids to feed those who are going to spit it back up, to pick up someone and wash them. I, I, can, I, 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 I can only tell you that God looks down at the selfless servants who give their time when nobody else is around except that, that one incapacitated person, whether that person is young or old, and that person, a servant goes and helps that person do what that person cannot do for themselves, and they do it out of love. That is the highest 
form of servanthood. And God says, Jesus said, I want you, my disciples, I don't want you to feel like I have graduated above that. I do the higher jobs and the, 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 the uh, minion, the peons, do the lower job. I'm, I, don't, I don't think that I'm now the, the one you bow down to and kiss my feet. No, I believe I'm the one who washes your feet. That's what it should be. Next. It can be a very yucky and grimy, time-consuming job to be a foot washer. This morning, we had, in this room, we had the Spanish come in and have their worship service. We had to have kids right in there. Just instantly, there's be little babies in there. So we have the most amazing nursery workers. Mrs. Hull, she, we don't pay her a thing. Just, just we needed a, a, a nursery director. She was asked, and she said she'd do it. And, and, and she tries to make the schedule up, and she usually puts herself in there more than she should. Let me, let me just remind you that I do not aspire to be a nursery worker. I don't look at that and go, lucky. I just can't believe you get to do that. I have to sit in the church and, and sing and, and have the service. I wish, I wish I could be in there. No. This morning, uh, just before we started service, I, I went into where our, our little primaries are, and, uh, and uh, I, 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 my wife was practicing our, the, the song we're going to sing for the Chinese uh, worship time. And so I went in there with the little guys, and there were some blocks on the floor. And, uh, and, and, and just get on the floor with them and build. I got to 14 blocks before they fell over, and it wasn't my fault, okay? David actually made it fall over after all that. But uh, building those blocks up with them, let me, let me just say that that is time-consuming that for the last hour there have been folks up in there with our kids up there. They don't even have little kids. For the last hour they were in there. I did it for five minutes. I'm like, are you back, man, babe? You finished? You ready? We say that when, when you take kids to camp, now I think, I mean, the way they act, Brother Frank enjoys it. I don't, well, come on, brother. That's amazing to me. And I do too. I actually, I, I enjoy going to camp with the kids. But let me tell you, when I, when you can ask my wife, when I look at it, it's a matter of, whew, I can get through this. I can sleep on this hard bunk. I can take showers with a bunch of screaming kids, uh, you know, trying to find way. Please, when you get out of the shower, please take all your stuff with you. Please don't leave any weird things in there. And they get in there, and you close it behind you, and you're hoping that no kid's going to just open it and walk in, you know, and you're, I'm in here! Stay out, you know, and, and you're trying to do it. You go eat the camp food and so forth. You know, you know why? You know why? We have youth workers who plan out activities because they're serving younger people. You know why they, they cook little treats and bring them on Wednesday nights? Because they're serving younger people. They're, they're, they're taking people that we have, we have right now, the, the, the owner of a business, he's got lots to do, and yet he says, you know, I will be there for our young people. That is foot washing. This morning I want to ask this question. Are you washing anybody's feet? If you're a Christian here this morning, are you fulfilling what Jesus, your master, told you and I to do? Now, you say, Pastor, how, do, how can I do that? Number one, you need to join this church. You can find a church you can be part of so that you can then be part of being a blessing around your community. Number two, in your home, there should be an amount of servant foot washing that happens. Let me just quickly say how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, young people, that you are the ones who unset the table and wash the dishes. But it's interesting how what we kind of think about it is there's always somebody else who should be doing it. I'm a man. I have four kids and a wife. I'm the last guy who should be washing dishes in our house. Just but okay. I already took out the garbage. That was my job growing up. I now have a son. It's his job to take out the garbage. Hey, man. Right. I mean, I can think of why the yard, that's the girls. They play out there, they go clean the yard up. Amen? Amen. The laundry, that's, that's not a man's job. My brain is so good at figuring out how it's never my job. It's just never quite my responsibility. Do you know what the truth is? Is that if the daddy of our home is above folding laundry and doing dishes and taking in the groceries, and taking the full bag out, and helping clean up. If I'm above that, I'm setting a terrible example that we are not a Christian home. Because we 
are a Christian home. So what does that mean? We want to be like our master. You know what a master did? He washed feet. For three, where you work, you ought to be the foot washer. I know that you, you have seniority. I know that you've been there longer than anybody else. But you ought to be the foot washer. You know what that means? The job that nobody else wants, you just do it. You don't act like it's a huge sacrifice. You just do it. And when you are the manager, you're still doing the hard jobs. You're taking the tough shifts. You're doing the things that other people don't want to do so that you can relieve them of the need of doing it. You take it on yourself. That's what Jesus taught us to do. We are Christians. And if you are going to be a genuine Christian, it's more than just wearing the pretty tie and the coat and the shoes. It's getting in there and saying, there's no toilet paper in this room. I'm not going to rant and rave about it. I'm going to figure out where the toilet paper is at. Without making a big uh, uh, hoopla about it, I'm going to grab a couple rolls. I'm going to put it in there, and I'm not going to act like I was just the most, most amazing boss. I'm going to just do it because it needs to be done. And that way with everything in our lives, if you are in your school, be the one that your teacher knows. I can ask you to take out that garbage, and you'll just do it. I can ask you to just wipe off the, bar, the board, and you just do it. I can just ask you to go collect the papers and you'll just do it. And I don't have to worry about you saying, well, I did it last time. You just get there and do it. And why would anybody ever do that? Because that's what Jesus told you to do. Well, you know what about these things, foot washing? Foot washing, this is what's frustrating to me, is that foot washing is so impermanent. What I mean by that is that when Jesus came and washed these men's feet, they then walked out an hour later and went to a garden and prayed all night. And then the next day when those men had run, when they walked in their homes, their feet were dirty again. They had to sit there and wash their feet again. And, and foot washing, it doesn't matter how many times you've done it, it has to be done again next week. And you know, when you're a foot washer, foot washing is not just one time. Well, six months ago I did nursery. Well, I washed, I washed the dishes that one time. Well, that was on our anniversary, our first anniversary 19 years ago. Well, I did. You know, you know what amazes me is that my wife, she folds laundry. Tonight she'll fold laundry, I'm sure, and tomorrow night the same laundry will be there again. Maybe fold it. You know what foot washing is? Foot washing is never a one and done thing. And a foot washer realizes that the same kids that need to be dealt with and loved and, and nurtured and taught and, and, and helped this week will have to be done next week and the week after and the week after, and the week after, and the foot washer just says, and I'll be there to do it. I'll be there to do it. I'll be there to do it. We need to have foot washers in our church, and you need foot washers in your home, and you need foot washers at your workplace. You need foot washers out in the community. Those are people that realize, I just cleaned up all the litter on my entire street. No one else is doing it, so I finally did it. Great me, and look at there's more. Yep, there's going to be more. You know what we do? We do it again. We do it again. We do it again. This is called Christianity. Jesus, before he died, said, hold it, gentlemen. Let me show you something. And he washed their feet. And, he, and they said, what are you doing? He said, you don't understand it now. You'll understand it in a minute. He washed their feet. And he said, okay, see what I just did? You do it too. And that was our job. Next. Foot washers are always underappreciated. Once you're finished washing someone's feet, you're lucky. Since you're the servant, the lowest servant in the home, you're lucky if the person says, Thanks. But if they do say the word thanks, does that really, really, does that really a, a pay you off for having knelt down in front of their grimy feet and gotten all the yuckiness off of their feet and wiped them off? Is that really worth it? Let me say that in our church, we, we, we want to try to honor people that are servants around here. I, I can't tell you how many people constantly here in this, in this ministry are, are, are constantly cleaning. But uh, I, I know that when I came in on Friday, there was a big bag of, of, of trash that was waiting to be put out. I knew oh, Mrs. Rodriguez had been here. She had been cleaning. And, uh, and, and, and she's not even here this morning. She's in the Spanish ministry. Uh, but Mrs. Rodriguez comes and cleans the bathrooms every single week. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. So you know what we do? About once a year we say, Mrs. Rodriguez, you're amazing. Thank you. And she's like, I'll do this 52 more times. Foot washing is always underappreciated. I try to tell you about how amazing it is that the Franks do the, the, uh, the Patch the Pirate Club every single week. I, week. If I mentioned it, one sentence every Sunday, how they do amazing things, it would not make up for the fact that they put so much time into it. 
that they, they prepare the activities and they think about new ideas and that they, they put, try to put a, a virtue and, and character into our children. This, this is always, a, a foot washer is always underappreciated. That doesn't, shouldn't stop us from being foot washers. And as every mother in this room knows, foot washers are always underappreciated. It's Mother's Day. Here's a card he made you. Well, thank you. I'll do this another 364 days. No, no, this is great. But foot washing is what makes a Christian like Jesus. Look with me at verse 17 and we'll stop. You know these things. Happy are ye You know who benefits the most from foot washing, according to Jesus himself? You know who it is? The foot washer. There is a law that Jesus instituted that says, you do these things, you'll be happy. If you are someone who washes feet, you're going to be happy. The inverse is also true. You want to know why we have such anxiety, depression. You know why we have that in our society right now? I'll tell you why. Because we have no foot washers. You know why we have people who are living in the United States of America where none of us have ever watched someone starve to death? Never have. We are living where none of us are going go to go home tonight and not be able to have electricity when we plug it in. We are living in the Sonoma County, this is beautiful. And we still have so many people who have to take pills so they don't want to kill themselves that day. You know why? No foot washing. My wife got to, to teach the young girls at camp um, a couple weeks ago. And uh, so she was sharing with me what she was planning on preaching on, or t- teaching on, teaching on, yeah, teaching, right. And, uh, and as she was teaching on it, I was like, don't tell them that to me, that's convicting. And, uh, but... Uh, if I understand it, babe, it was basically become foot washers. That's what basically it was. And it was something like this. And tell me if I'm wrong. But if you will get your eyes off of you and onto others, everything changes. If you want to know why somebody is mopey, it's because their eyes are on themselves. If you want to know why somebody's grumpy, it's because they're always thinking about what I'm not getting and what I deserve instead of putting their, uh, their mind on what do others need. This morning, if you are a foot washer, you're a happy person in this room right now. If you're not a foot washer, you're not. If you want to be happier, get to work blessing other people, finding the job that nobody else wants to do, and getting it done. I'm not saying it's fun at the moment when you're washing that foot, but I'm saying you are going to be a happy person. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Jesus just used the word, did he not? You'll see in the Bible so many times about joy, joy, joy. And you will hear preachers preach against how bad happiness is. Go for joy. Don't go for happiness. But I'll just tell you this. Jesus said, I want you to be happy. And I'll tell you the secret of being happy. Become a foot washer. I'm not sure how it all works. I'm not sure the, the, how, how he, he constructed the whole universe to operate in this way. But here's how it works. Here's how it turns out. Those who serve others are the ones whose hearts get to enjoy going through life happy. Those who demand to be served, those who have full expectation that, Mom, where's my food? Dad, of course you're going to let me live here. Of course this is where you pay the bills for me. I'm your son, of course. Where's my clothes, by the way? I need new jeans. Where's my clothes? That kind of person is the person who, in the end, is going to be miserable. And if you are like so many, and you have been looking around this whole sermon thinking you're like, yep, that person should be doing what's serving, and that person, they'd be happy if they were. They're depressed because of it. Let me give you some advice. Just for a moment, take the word of God and shine it straight at yourself and saying, how am I doing? Not how's my wife doing? Not how are my kids doing? Not how's the pastor and his family doing? How am I doing right now? Not how's my boss how are my employees doing? No. I want you to, right, just for a moment, say, dear Jesus, show me me. Let me not be the one who 
sticks to everyone and says, why aren't you serving? You should serve. You Rather, just put the entire attention on how can I, William Miracle, better serve in this church, these people, my family, my beloved friends, my community. How can I be a foot washer? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I don't know in this room right now who's saved and who's not. God, I have no idea who's ever accepted you as their Savior and who has not. But God, I know for a fact that in this, this room, in so many people, there's, there's going to be people who have never been saved, who've never trusted you as their Savior. They've, they've heard about you. They've learned about you all their lives, maybe. But Lord, I'm sure there's some who've never really, truly accepted you as their Savior. And God, I pray this morning they realize their heart needs to be washed. They, there's, there's no way they can scrub themselves clean. They need your blood to do the washing, and that's it. God, I pray that you would do that that miraculous work in somebody's heart this morning. God, I pray for those in this room who are already believers, that God, you would convict us, Father. Help us to realize where we're, we're, we're missing, where we're, we are failing to be what you want us to be. God, I pray that we would look back in just the last few days in our homes. Lord, I, I, I'm convicted myself just, just thinking about it. God, I pray that you please forgive me, Father, that I have not been as much of a foot washer in just the last seven days as I should have been. God, thank you that, Lord, you gave me that little chance, though, to take a few boys out, take them on a good time, and just try to bless their hearts. God, I pray that you please let that happen. Let those boys feel blessed. God, thank you that the little bit of things that I do, the little tiny bit that I, that I, that I get to serve, I come back and I, my heart is filled to overflowing. God, I pray that you please work in our hearts right now that we be the kind who in this church we are willing to serve. We are willing to be ushers. We are willing to clean. We are willing to sing. We are willing to, to teach in the, in the Sunday school and work in the nursery. God, I pray that you'd give us a, a church full of foot washers. God, I pray that we become like our master, that we would be just like you were when you put that towel around yourself and knelt before your inferiors and became their servant. God, I pray that it would happen from the, from the oldest all the way down to the youngest in our church, that we would give a good example to the world of people whose lives have been changed so much that the macho has become the minister. God, I pray you please give us that kind of a church. Oh, God, I beg you. With everybody's head and everybody's eyes, head bowed.